uh, hand uh, uh, the stage to Mehmet Taşçıoğlu, who is the president for the Takam High School chapter. We are very pleased to have him and he will uh, lead the rest of the event. So welcome to the Takam High School chapter's October career webinar on automobile engineers. Thank you, President Yaya, for the amazing introduction. And once again, as he restated, and I'll restate it myself, we've got a lot of exciting events coming up that are going to commemorate Turkey and the Republic. And we've also, Takam High School chapter has made a video as well on that. So my name is Mehmet, and I'm the president of the Takam High School chapter. And today here with me, we have my high school chapter members who are helping run the event, as well as three very special guests who are automobile engineers who will be speaking today and giving some insight onto their careers. So first we're gonna begin with an introduction and then we're gonna get into a question answer session. And we've got a couple of fun games built into the webinar as well, fun interactive games. So how it'll work is that the game will be two truths and a lie where each engineer has two true facts about themselves and their career and then one lie and the audience is going to try to guess which one the lie is. So those are going to be sprinkled throughout the webinar to make it fun. So first, so at first we have Mina Tashchi, who is a senior engineer at GM. So uh, Mina, would you like to do your introduction? Sure, uh, thank you, uh, dear president, uh, two presidents, uh, Adam and uh, uh, Mehmet Jim, thank you so much for a nice introduction and for the opportunity. And I would like to uh, share, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So just so that I have my thoughts together, I just put them in on a couple slides. Uh, this is part of the intro introduction. So uh, about me, uh, so I, Mene Taski Ozal, uh, I was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey, and uh, I'm youngest of four children. And uh, uh, and I moved to uh, Nebraska, USA, in 1991, and ever since living in the U.S. And I, uh, by training, I'm an aeronautical engineer, Chuck uh from Istanbul Technical University. So uh, and then. Um, just a little bit of a uh, boasting. I was first at, in class and third in the uh, Istanbul Technical University to graduate. So I was awarded uh, in a, a scholarship to come to the US and I came to uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln for Master of Science in uh, Engineering Mechanics. That is, there's mechanical engineering and engineering mechanics. It's, it's similar with uh, some nuances uh, between the two differences, small differences. So uh, I'm a, and ever since I graduated, I've been working for GM, um, my one and only company that I've worked for. I held various positions. So I'm, I'm in the automotive and there's a lot of parallels between aeronautical and automotive. So I was able to use every, everything that I was trained in, but there's a lot of on the job training. There's various positions that I've held throughout my career, which is 25 years now, in vehicle testing, ride and handling, a lot of virtual uh, computer-aided engineering right now uh, in terms of uh, ride handling, durability, chassis design, and uh, hobbies, uh, singing, playing guitar, um, of course, uh, like many of you, traveling and uh, nonprofit act activity. And I was in the Takam board for about 10 years, two of which I was the president. So uh, just to give you a, sh a short, like, uh, oh, you know, there's one more thing, one more slide. Uh, what does a mechanical engineer do? Engineers use math and science and uh, imaginations to find solutions to technical problems, right? So. Uh, there's new design, new products, or also we we design, uh, or we always try to make things better that are already existing. So a lot of imagination is used in our in our job. So that's that's very fulfilling. And uh, just very quickly, I wanted to, sorry, I wanted to 
give you like what we do, just a small, uh, just to show you what engineers try to avoid. This is a minute video. Vibration issues. So we try to keep a lot of these vibrations that may cause issues along. So what we call resonance. So you'll see some examples. Look at the vibrating rear axle. These are real. The turbine engine. So I can pick up any more of uh, my uh, time of your time from uh, other participants. So let me just close this. So anyway, that's about uh, me. So uh, we can, I guess, continue with uh, the rest of our, uh, uh, our, uh, I guess, uh, engineer colleagues. Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction. So next, our second engineer is Chalian Tashchoolu, a mechanical engineer currently working at FCA as a product chief. Product chief. Merhaba. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I'm Chalian Tashchoolu. Uh, I was born and raised in Turkey, and I moved to United States in 1999. Um, I had my mechanical engineering degree in Turkey, uh, similar to Mina from Istanbul Technical University. I have also master's degree from Istanbul Technical University. Um, I came to United States to work um, and I started my first job at Ford um, as product engineer. Since then, I've been working on the mostly in the OEMs, uh, in the product development, um, and I'm mostly in the automotive industry. And I'm uh, I'm very happy to be an engineer, and I really encourage for those folks who uh, are interested in, in this call to uh, for engineering career to listen to this. I'm quite sure they will learn from us. And please don't hesitate to stop us and ask questions. Uh, so we can, if any way we can help you, I think that's uh, our job today. Um, so uh, my engineering career is, uh, as I said, is most in product development. And I am mechanical engineer. I work in the body engineering and uh, mostly sheet metals, plastics. Um, and recently, I'm responsible for the lightning at FCA. Uh, I work on the headlamps, tail lamps, all the exterior lightning. So, um, so it's pretty fun, actually. It's a new technology. Um, as I said, you learn a lot as you move in your career. I don't have slides like uh, Mina showed, but um, I can. I will probably talk a lot about our uh, products as we go on. Thank you. And by the way, I really appreciate Takam to uh, all this event. Thanks, Mehmet. Thank you for the great introduction. And then our third engineer today is Ertuğrul Tepe, an electrical engineer currently working at the University of Windsor. So thank you for joining us and your introduction. Hi guys, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, my name is Kemal Ertuğrul Tepe. Uh, I, usually use my first name Kamal as the uh, in because it's shorter it's hard, easy to pronounce in uh, in US and Canada so uh, 
Yeah, I am an, uh, slightly different. I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, so I finished my uh, electrical engineering degree uh, in 1992 from Hacettepe University. And then I worked uh, maybe two years in Ankara uh, in a small uh, company uh, designing <clears throat> Uh, communication systems. Uh, then I uh, completed my military service. Then uh, I got a scholarship. Uh, I uh, awarded a scholarship to study in the US and I came to New York, upstate New York. And I uh, went to a, a well-known engineering school, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I did my master's and PhD. After my graduation in 2001, I started working another telecommunication company in New Jersey. And I worked for uh, almost like uh, two years uh, in that company. Then uh, I we wanted to venture something else, and I started working my university career as a uh, assistant professor. So I started teaching and doing some research related to communication systems, and I worked there like a number of years, almost seventeen years. Uh, I still uh, have association with the University of Windsor, but. Now I work for GM like Mine. So uh, I also have, uh, I, I worked on connected and autonomous vehicles uh, uh, division of GM. And I am primarily responsible for uh, cyber security or security problems of the uh, upcoming vehicles or uh, vehicle connectivity. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all about my uh, uh, development, uh, career development. Uh, yeah, I will. I will be happy to share my experience and what I know with the young kids like you. Yes. Thank you very much for the great introductions, everybody. So at this point, I'm going to hand the floor to Elif Bayer and Eja Uyuler, who will be asking our questions. If anybody has a question that is not listed or anything, you can add it in the chat. And then we've got Tarek monitoring the chat as well. So Eja and Elif, the floor is yours. Okay, so the first question is, what is the most rewarding part about being an engineer? In, in which order should we like switch orders? One, you know, one person goes or uh, how do, should we do? Ladies first, Mina, go first. Always. All right, thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, I keep, I'm gonna keep sharing because I put this so that I don't lose my thought or I don't venture out too long. I put the, these questions in a, can you see my screen? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it okay. looks good. All right. So um, the first question is what part of, about being an engineer, especially in automotive in my case, to see the finished product that you help design in real life. So you see the 2020 Chevy Corvette string, Stingray. So last four years of my career was mostly spent on this. So that's my answer. Mina, if you show one more slide, I'm gonna leave. You look <laughs> like you're so unprepared. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I just, okay, I won't show the rest of them. All I are. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, well, I go next. Uh, I I guess uh, I think the most uh, rewarding part of being an engineer is the the way we think. Um, I think there are a couple actually, but I want to mention this more than the other one because engineering is a way of life. Uh, every, even you, those principles you learn um, using data, being uh, thinking logically, not emotionally, is a gift for engineers. And you take that and apply it to your life. Um, I think that's, that's what I would say. Uh, but the other one I really want to mention is the uh, ben benefit the society, right? We, we develop products and people use them. And when I see them actually using the, the cars we build, and I, I'm proud of myself, I'm proud of my company. That's it. Yeah, it's it's. Next is me or hello. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, uh, what is the most rewarding uh, part of your part of being engineer? 
I will say like um, the other uh, colleagues of mine, like a problem solving. And um, basically you are solving problems uh, that helps people or improves the quality of life in humans, in uh, people's life. I mean, it can be uh, anything like automotive. We are talking about automotive today, but uh, I was a little bit outside of automotive uh, before uh, working in Detroit. Uh, communication systems, for example, uh, aerobotics, and a number of other fields. Uh, I mean, as an engineer, you are helping uh, improving the quality of life of the people. So that is the uh, one of the rewarding parts of this business. For example, when I started uh, my career, uh, we weren't, I mean, we didn't know much about cellular or uh, cell phones. Today, everybody has one and you can communicate and uh, allow, uh, t <clears throat> get in touch with your loved ones uh, quickly. For example, you can quickly call uh, your friends in Turkey or other uh, destinations. Uh, uh, with audio video. Uh, I give you an example. For example, my first job in Ankara was uh, installing video conferencing equipment, just like we are doing today. At that time, the cost of that equipment was $100,000. And, uh, and in Turkey, we didn't have uh, resources to reliably communicate uh, through uh, video conferencing. Uh, if you come back uh, like 30 years, almost like uh, 30 years from that, uh, at that time, we are doing everything remotely. We, and this, uh, in the pandemic situation, we have a chance of uh, be productive with the uh, communication infrastructure that we are using today. So, uh, yeah, I would just like to summarize, like most rewarding part is helping people to uh, achieve their dreams and uh, adding value to what already we have. Okay, cool. Um, so the next question for you guys is how many hours do you work each week? And what are your experiences in regards to working overtime? Okay, I go first again. All right. Um, so I won't show my presentation. I do have all these questions. Yeah, go ahead. Just, that's, that's fine. That's I'm okay. not No, I'm just in the interest of time, it's easier anyway, but I'll share yeah. this at the end of the, uh, the meeting with the team, but I just, uh, this way, you know, I'm brief and I get the points across. So work-life balance, that's the biggest buzzword in GM right now. So work-life balance is very important. So we should not, we should never lose a sight of it. So uh, just remember that when you also start your careers, but uh, <laughs> there's a but. Typically I work minimum 50 hours a week, sometimes up to 60, 70 hours a week or even weekends. Uh, as you get more experienced and will move up in your career, there are these unwritten, role, uh, unwritten rules that are, you're supposed to work what's called casual overtime. So the casual overtime means you work, but you don't necessarily get compensated uh, monetarily for it. But uh, as long as that's not all the time, that's not constant, I'm willing to do whatever it takes that the company requires me to do. Uh, that would mean some days we may ha even have to work over a uh, weekend to meet, meet deadlines, but uh, in general, it's cyclical. So some, some weeks it's not so bad and some weeks it's so, uh, yeah, that, that just comes and goes. But I think we have, uh, we have, we should be aware of our deadlines and do whatever it takes as long as it's not all the time. Yep, that's it. Okay, um, I'll tell you what I do first and then what young engineers do and I'll give you some other scenarios. Uh, so I typically work 50 hours to 60 hours. Um, but again, I'm experienced uh, some 20 years uh, experience in the automotive industry and my field and I have other managerial responsibilities. So it's probably not a good benchmark for you, uh, but for our younger engineers with like zero to three years experience, they typically work 40 to 50 hours. Some of them work more, some of them work less, but uh, that's typical in, in as FCA. Um, 
but it also it this depends on your, your the responsibility your position like let's say like as i said in the product development we have phases you know you start in the concept design eventually you, you build the vehicle right there are really stressed phases of the program or some like maintenance part of the program right so sometimes you really work 60 hours, seven hours, some, some build issue comes, the line stops, you get a solve that problem. Now it doesn't matter, it's midnight or Saturday, you still have to go out there and take care of that thing. And, or like you, you finish the design, tools are being built. Um, now it's the lost time of the program. You just clean up the house, getting ready for the pilot builds. So that time you probably go into a uh, less intense part of the program, you work less. Uh, some people work always in the first, the first part of the product development, then they just work fit for the hours a week. Some people work uh, at the end of the pro product development, they are launching all the time, they have to work a lot of hours. So if you end up having a job at the plant, really you're at the mercy of that what's going on at the plant because those guys start at six o'clock maybe they sometimes work till six o'clock too but they, they get a lot of overtime so um overtime policy is very flexible for those folks on the front line for and the early phase of the program is probably uh not that much given um I, i'm not sure you guys clear about the overtime and overall, like how many hours the engineers work? Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll take over. I think that's a tricky question. Uh, first, I like to tell uh, young folks that uh, engineers not necessarily paid in hours, so we are not in. Uh, we are not paid per hour. So we are salaried workers. So uh, mostly, uh, I mean, most of the scenarios and typical engineers, uh, I mean, uh, weekly uh, time demand is like 50, 60 hours. That's like uh, Mina and uh, Charlie on set, but uh, it depends. Uh, it depends sometimes like a project. I mean, usually like uh, as an engineer, you are involved, with, involved in a project and uh, there are project deadlines and, uh, and you need to meet these deadlines. Sometimes like you need to put more hours and then maybe uh, you need to reduce your hours uh, when you successfully complete the project until you start a new one. Uh, but typically like uh, 50, 60 hours uh, per week is uh, average. Uh, but there are there were times that I think I worked maybe like uh, uh, much more than that uh, per week or in a span of like two, three days. Uh, maybe slept maybe 10 hours and then, but still worked on the project uh, because there were deadlines. There are a lot of uh, things that depends on uh, what you do. Uh, but as long as like you uh, like your, what you are doing, uh, you don't really keep looking at your watch. So uh, that's, I think more critical uh, if, you, uh, if you like what you are doing. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so far for everybody who has been for these two questions. But now we're gonna have our first interactive game, which will be two truths and a lie. So first we have Mine Tashchi and her two truths and a lie. So how this will work is she's gonna read three statements and then one of it, two of them are gonna be true and then one of them is gonna be a lie. And then we here are gonna launch a poll and everybody's gonna select which one they think is a lie. So this will happen three times throughout it just to keep it fun and have the audience interactive. And then at the end, after the results are shown, Mine will reveal which one was a lie. So Mine, you can go ahead and share your statements. You're on mute, I think.
Yes, sorry, I won't mute from now on. I just was, all right. So uh, the first one is, let me just read them off to you. Uh, I starred in a General Motor Motors commercial and I worked on GM's Mars Rover project. And I have a music album sold in Turkey. I guess that's not regarding the career, but let me just put these on the share so that you'll remember what's what. So share. So the poll has been launched. I think I know the answer, but <laughs> so I think unless anybody else wants to put their answer in, um, we'll share the results here. So final chances to make your guess and let's reveal the answers. So Mina, you can, I'm not sure if this is the one that's wrong, but you can share the correct, the one that's a lie now. The lie is the second one. I worked on the, uh, the rover, GM's rover, uh, GM's Mars rover project. I do have a, <laughs> I did start in a GM commercial and I do have a album sold into a commercially sold in Turkey, but uh, the second one uh, is a <laughs> lie. So. Okay, so I guess- It was the first one, the uh, majority guessed, right? Was the lie? Yes. Okay, yeah, and it's not. So that's it, great job, so. So some, some did guess the second one. We can move on, I'm done. Okay. This is fun. Great, great idea. Elif, I think the next question. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the next question is, how did your high school education help you get onto the path of being an engineer? And is there anything you wish you could change about your high school years? Now, I don't want to go first all the time. You know, that way I'll, I'll give them a chance to my <laughs> dear colleagues and friends. So if you guys want to go next. Uh, Chalman, if you want to start this time. Sure. Yeah, Charlie, you go ahead and then. Okay. Um, well, I was very strong in math and I like science, not every part of science. The biology and chemistry was painful, but I loved physics. Um, and math was my really the strongest part of my whole high school education. And I really build on my strength. Um, and I plan to be an engineer um, probably from my junior year. And, um, and I, I had few options I wanted to be, mechanical, electrical, or environmental engineering. And I landed on NME. So um, I guess uh, you need to know what you are actually want to do. Um, as early as possible. So you can align your course selections, um, your summer activities accordingly. Um, I, I really highly recommend you to get a job. It could be, it can, it can be non-engineering related just to, um, to get some experience um, to, to use your creative part of your uh, skills. As, uh, if you haven't uh, any job will offer you some opportunities, some creativity, even like the 
let's say you go get a job at the, the drugstore and they they piling up those bottles you know there's a different way of doing it uh, and you can save space or is a problem to solve that those are the experience you carry over to your college years and then after that your uh, work experience work uh, um, so I, I wish I could have probably gotten a job at high school and and any job, and then I, I can probably benefit from that. That's it. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll go second. Uh, yeah, just like uh, Charlie, and I think uh, I also like math and uh, physics. I also like chemistry. Uh, yeah, I wasn't big into biology, but uh, yeah, I, I like that too. Uh, so, I mean, anyone, uh, I think the education, uh, high school education and math, physics, uh, general sciences helps a lot in engineering because uh, you're a big part of your, uh, in the engineering school also after your uh, university, you need to do a lot of number crunching and also understand the uh, physics or uh, connections uh, between the systems. So uh, that's why I think uh, STEM uh, courses are critical uh, for your success in engineering. Uh, when I like, when I go back and redo my uh, high school, I think I will emphasize or try to learn more about the uh, communication uh, and uh, communication skills and history. We didn't. Uh, we thought that these are not super critical for uh, engineering or what uh, in the future. But uh, communication is a big, uh, big uh, part of our job. And also as a human, uh, technology transfer and uh, expressing your ideas to others and uh, and uh, documenting. Uh, your uh, solutions or your ideas for future generations or your colleagues requires uh, uh, strong communication skills, uh, language skills, and uh, and uh, uh, these type of uh, social science uh, uh, related courses too. So I also recommend everyone to uh, pay attention to these and then uh, in, in addition to your math and science skills, uh, increase your communication and literature uh, skills as well. Okay, uh, sounds like you're done, Ed. So um, what, I guess, first part of the question, what did your high school education help you to get to onto the path of engineering? Um, I was in the math and science section in high school because you, you would split up in either math and science or the, the language or language and arts kind of. Uh, but I was on the math and science. So that definitely helped. And I, in math has always been my most favorite subject, physics, math and all that. So that helps. But uh, unfortunately, back in the day that when I was in going through this, there was not we were not really very um, informed of what we wanted to be. You know, if, if you did well in a college uh, entrance exam, you got into wherever you are. So it was almost purely luck that, you know, I was a good student and I, you know, scored well to get into a, an engineering school and I did, you know, but nowadays I would recommend you to really start finding your passions. And, uh, and engineering is such a, a, to me, it has become a passion afterwards because it's just, there's, it's so imaginative. So that's the first one. The second part of the question is what would you change if you were to go back to the, to your high school education? Two things. Uh, one is I wish I had, I learned to type with 10 fingers, like typing, definitely has become such an, um, uh, it beca became a, such a necessity as, as soon as I started my job, my you know professional career at GM, I taught myself, my office mate at the time showed me and I taught myself. So I'm 
maybe 85, 90% efficient, but maybe if I learned it younger, I would have been even better, but uh, you know, I had to teach myself. The second part is what I would recommend to you is public speaking and presentation skills uh, early on in life. Those become almost more important than the subject itself, how you get to the point across. So those would be also imagine, imagine, imagine. So that in every job, engineering relies on that. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is, what is your typical work day like? And what parts do you enjoy the most? And what, what parts do you not enjoy the most? Maybe Charlie, oh, I can go. Yeah, I can go at uh, with this one. Uh, what is your uh, typical workday like? So, uh, uh, I mean, in a typical day, you uh, when you start working, I, I start around like eight thirty uh, or eight o'clock in the morning, uh, and then first thing you do is check your uh, calendar, uh, what kind of meetings you have, and a uh, number of other things. Uh, you try to organize your day, and then. Uh, and then uh, you have a, like a, uh, the projects. Usually, typically, you have like one or two projects uh, that you are you need to work on, and then you need to identify what parts of these projects you need to uh, somewhat uh, are critical or you need to finish. So you start with this. Uh, uh, either uh, I mean, in my job, sometimes I write programs, uh, computer programs. Sometimes I write. Uh, I need to document things and or. Uh, communicate with others, number of other things. So you start uh, tackling these uh, tasks. And then uh, uh, in these days, and also in the, uh, before the uh, pandemic, we had meetings. Uh, you need to collaborate a lot with the other engineers because uh, in, in these days, uh, nothing gets done by single person. You usually uh, there's a project, but you are doing some part of the project. Uh, but the others are also involved. So you need to communicate and organize your, uh, your uh, uh, thoughts with them. So that's why you need to meet and you need to collaborate. And uh, typically day goes on like that. Uh, you, you try to check as, my, as many uh, checkboxes in your uh, task list. And then uh, you, may, you may give a, like a, a lunch break uh, during the, uh, I mean, uh, and then after that, maybe, until four or five, you continue. Uh, sometimes I feel that I'm more productive in the late afternoon. So I try to drag on until like six, six thirty-ish uh, to uh, tackle on some of the other problems. And you try to leave the, uh, your day with a, uh, uh, where you wanna start next, next, uh, next day. So if, for example, if you are finishing off a, like a computer program, you don't wanna leave it at that uh, five o'clock maybe you need to uh, continue another half hour to complete uh, certain aspects of it so you can have uh, easier starting uh, time uh, next day. So that is the typical work day. Uh, what I enjoy uh, the most is, uh, I mean, uh, as we said at the beginning, like problem solving. So usually like you try to solve a problem and then if you have a hand, good handle of the, uh, the solution, uh, it doesn't have to be complete, but at least you can uh, solve this in your head or in your, uh, uh, in your, with your means. Uh, if you ha have a, this feel, uh, then uh, it is the, uh, the part that I enjoy the most. So I, when you have the aha moment in the day, uh, it is, you get a little bit lot more relaxed, more uh, enjoy what you are doing, but uh, before that, until you reach that point, maybe it's a little bit uh, slightly more stressful. Um, what parts uh, you do not enjoy as much? I mean, uh, it's not about the day uh, and it's not about the uh, enjoyment, but if something slightly drags on and if you do not have a, like a clear vision how to handle this problem, uh, uh, that is a little bit like uh, maybe stressful, but at the same time enjoyable because you're you are more valuable uh, when you solve harder problems. So uh, that is I don't want to say not enjoyable, but it creates some kind of a stress uh, until you reach uh, a clear vision about your task or uh, the problems that you are solving. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop in this, yeah. Then if we're going in a kind of a round, um, a clockwise kind of, uh, so I'll go next. So what is the typical day, work day like? Uh, that obviously before and after COVID-19 is, is different. Uh, when I used to be in the office, you know, as soon as you get in the office, everyone gets their coffee or tea and a little chit chat always in the office place, which, or at the, uh, you know, where the coffee machine is. And there's a lot of ideas that gets across that way. So that that's not to minimize that. So what we are missing now working from home is that collaboration. So, and they're trying to get those virtual coffee talks and things like that within the company that uh, Kemal and I work for. Uh, but we are definitely losing that people side of things. But otherwise, um, you know, when, when we used to be in the office, just because I, you know, I'm in the testing environment, I get to meet with my technicians and with the engineer colleagues. Uh, you know, if the technician is doing a test for me, I review what, you know, data he takes. Sometimes I take the vehicle prototype vehicle out on myself on a test track and test uh, different parts of the vehicle. Uh, and I mostly work on the virtual environment, like virtual engineering. We build a lot of stuff in uh, computer aided uh, engineering now, but you have to make sure that you, uh, what we call closed loop learning with an actual hardware. So that's, that's the part that I get to do. And what part do I not enjoy as much? Um, meetings. The sometimes, you know, in a big company, uh, there may be meeting after another, so they may get in the way of doing act the actual work. Uh, although, you know, there's a lot of uh, ideas shared in a meeting, but sometimes they may drag on. So that may be the part that I, I wouldn't say I don't like, but uh, that sometimes get to be a little too long. So, but you know, we work well. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm going to probably say more similar things. Uh, I start my day by checking my calendar. Uh, typically, meetings start around 7, some days earlier than 7, and most of the time between 7 and 7.30. And I need to decide which ones I need to attend. And recently, most days actually it goes on all day until 5, 6. So there is really not time much time left to actually do other work or you try to multitask and do multiple things in a meeting and you miss something. Um, so there's, I think that's part of the COVID environment that now they know you're home. I mean, most of work from home now and uh, then you're available. You have to ans answer the instance communicator messages or respond to emails. In the automotive industry, things happen pretty quick. If something comes up, you have to solve the problem. You have to give an update, come up with a plan, talking about days, uh, sometimes hours. So there are days like we meet at four o'clock, we meet at seven o'clock in the evening, nine o'clock if there's not, if we can need to get more updates. So it, it's very dynamic. I think that's, that's, that's really good because uh, things move faster. You don't have to, uh, wait days to to talk about the same thing and issues um, and I have meetings with my direct reports and I have meetings with my manager one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings and those meetings are real casual relaxed um, the also the meetings to upper management is pretty stressful uh, now you go in front of uh, high-level directors uh, uh, Sometimes VPs, uh, like, you know, you, you need to deliver the message. You need to have a good presentation. Um, and what I really like most is, uh, maybe I'll just give you a little bit overview of what the, what the whole phase of product development. You start with the product planning and then you concept design, actual design. And then once you finish design, you build the tools to make that particular component. And then you, those components are made, you start assembling them, we call it then pilot vehicles, then you can test those vehicles, learn it, correct the problems on the components. And then eventually 
we launch it, we get the product out to the customers. It doesn't end there. And the customers use, they come complain, now I have this problem. Now you start solving those problems. And some of them, it really goes beyond complaints and um, those end up being a recalls, the bigger problem. So in order I told you from product planning to recall, is stress level goes up. And there are fun parts of them each stage, but I, we have a recall meeting tomorrow and it's probably one, the first thing I wanna do uh, that tomorrow is because it's, I'll be answering tons of tough questions. Why this doesn't happen and how we're gonna correct this, how we're gonna prevent this from happening because there's a cost associated. When you're planning the product or design, everything is free. You just draw in the lines, writing emails. When the product is out there, something you wanna change, it costs you money. As you get closer to the expense, the cost part, the stress level goes up, you get more attention from the management. So that was those, those issues, those, that part of the uh, product development is pretty stressful and I don't enjoy much. Uh, and if you, you have a good uh, presentation or solve a problem, you know, at least you get something back. Um, but it's in overall is every stage is different. And uh, some people like more of the, the, the testing part, some people more like uh, actual touching the parts. And I really like going into plants and suppliers and looking at and turning it and then just exchanging ideas. Like that's the good part. Um, that's what I like most. Okay, any questions? Okay. Um... So, so now we're gonna do, oh. Oh, sorry, um, we, we have one more question for that. Um, so okay. we're gonna, we have a limited amount of time right now. We only have 10 minutes and we still have five questions and uh, we wanna do the chat questions too. So if we could um, just answer a little bit more briefly, um, that would be great. So the next question will be, um, as an engineer, what are some difficult decisions you have to make during your work day? And, how do you make these decisions? Sure, I can go first. So um, yeah, thankfully, I'm not in those situations often, um, but if, if it, sometimes if we are in a uh, like cost versus uh, parts, parts cost versus safety type of uh, situations, safety is always number one especially with some of the issues GM has had in the past with the ignition switch issues and all that. So I'm gonna be brief. Uh, it's always customer safety and, the, uh, and of course the employee safety comes first. And uh, minor dis uh, disagreements in a team, sometimes project team comes up. Those are ha handled in a very professional manner with considerations such as Effort versus gain, advantages versus disadvantages, cost to company, company, et cetera. So um, that's it. I'll just be brief. I think the toughest decisions are employee-related decisions. Uh, like, like there's a low-performing employee. I know this is not straight engineering-related uh, technical issue, but uh, if someone is not performing, you need to talk to him, tell him, to uh, recover from his current situation, or in some cases, you have to tell someone, hey, um, you, have to, uh, you have to release you, let you go. Like this, these are probably the toughest decisions. And if you guys are good, I know you are, one point of your career, you will be managers, you will manage people. When you get there, you need to have the courage to make tough decisions. If you're not, don't take your carry into that path to go do something more technical, stay in specialized technical expertise, like, you know, develop those, like, uh, those skills. Because uh, you need to develop the human part of your uh, skills and that comes with uh, making tough decisions. I'll just stop here. Yeah, I can skip this question because I think it was answered pretty well by uh, the others.
Uh, okay, so now we're gonna do true, true, two truths and a lie. Um, so, Charlie and Amja, this is for you. So you're just gonna tell us your two truths and one lie, and then I don't have the poll option. So Mehmet, you're gonna need to put up a poll for everybody to answer, and uh, and then we'll continue with the questions. Okay, I can lie a lot though, but you know. <laughs> All right. Um... I don't have anything to present, but I went to Japan uh, in 2004. I don't like Japanese food and I ate pizza every day for three weeks. It's number one. Number two, um, I managed a team to introduce first LED headlights in North America. Number three, um, as product engineer, my first product was a phone, public phone. I'm not sure you guys know this, but at the airports, maybe you can still see it. What is the third one, Charlie, on again? Oh, my first product. Third one, is, uh, third, uh, three, number three. Right, as a product engine, as a product engineer, uh, my first uh, responsibility was the public phones. Oh, okay, wow. <laughs> first one is uh, the pizza. Second one is LED headlamp. Third one is the phone. Um, okay, so as everybody uh, answered in the chat for the poll, um, I think I think everybody has. I can't see the poll, so minute you're gonna have to tell everybody what the what everyone answered. Oh, okay. Also, oh, it's a tie between A and B. Um, telling them to which one was the lie. I'm a good liar. Look at this. It's pretty well balanced. <laughs> Second one is actually, it was true that I actually did the first LED headlamps, but not in North America. It was at first at FCA in 2016. Wow, nice. Okay, so... Um, the next question for you guys is, um, what were your experiences with career advancement through your career? Do you gain new opportunities through your career or is it relatively stagnant? Um, I think I wanna go first. Um, there are two paths. Uh, as an engineer, you can pursue, you can, you can specialize in, the, in one area or you can um, have a plan to diversify your experience. And I see people doing both ways. Um, some people stay, they become, a, let's say, wiper engineer, glass engineer. And then they become technical technician, technical expert, and like maybe manager in that area. It maybe even go can go up. Some people do glass and uh, maybe radios if they have the EE background. Like if they can do multiple things, right? So nothing wrong with that. You just need to decide what you wanted to do. Um, um, and I, I've done the second. I, I have, I had, I rotated in different areas. I even did uh, the cost engineering in finance uh, after I got my MBA. I think that helped me a lot to understand the finance part of uh, product development. Um, so my suggestion is you you should really develop a path. You need to plan it. You need to plan it at. And when you actually in the college, 
and uh, what area you're gonna do. And then uh, you, I recommend you to get a mentor and then uh, do planning. And engineers can also get masters and uh, you can get your MBA, I highly recommend if you're thinking engineering field. An MBA will actually take your mind to, to, to different level of thinking um, because engineers are, as we said, is very logical. Uh, and you actually become more logical in a different perspective if you get your business degree. Um, I know the time is limited. I'm going to stop it here. I can, oh, or Eric, do you want to go? You're on mute, Eric. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was on mute. Okay, so I'll go first, uh, I'll, I'll second. Uh, yeah, I think uh, engineering, uh, I, I just like to differentiate these two, like studying engineering and uh, being an engineer. So uh, if young, for the young folks, I think I recommend studying engineering uh, in the undergrad uh, because it opens up a lot of opportunities for fur further development, like future. If you study engineering, you can be a lawyer, you can do uh, the medical doctor, you can be business, uh, you can go to business. Uh, uh, I mean, you do MBA or other uh, uh, masters uh, in business and do other uh, things in, uh, in the future. So engineering, uh, gives you a solid background in logical thinking, problem solving, and a number of other uh, skills you can develop. And then, uh, I mean, if you like to stay in this, uh, if, you, uh, if you really, really like uh, what you have been studying, you can do master's and PhD, and you can advance your career uh, in different ways. Uh, for example, like uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the and the, uh, founder of Google, they were in computer science, a part of engineering, computer engineering, and then uh, they did their PhD and then uh, they started their uh, ideas in the Google, look what happened after 20 years. Uh, and a uh, number of other, uh, uh, if you look at the Elon Musk, right, a similar concept. So he, did, uh, he didn't do necessarily engineering, but he was involved with engineering uh, uh, in his undergrad, and then he went into uh, building companies uh, in a row, uh, starting from PayPal and other things. So uh, engineering uh, gives you, uh, I mean, studying engineering gives you a, a really good perspective in life. And also you learn so many things uh, like trade-offs uh, between um, ideas, a cost, and uh, the efficiency and number of other things. So you look at the life uh, from this perspective, which helps you whatever you do in, in the future. Uh, but if you, uh, yeah, as uh, if you, engineer in, in a sense, like you need to solve problems, uh, you like to solve problems in a systematic way. And uh, that's, uh, you, you, you become, and whatever you do after that is up to you. All right, I'll go next. I think uh, just to reiterate the question, uh, because a question got out of, out of order for me, I want to make sure. What were your experiences with career advancement throughout your career? Do you gain new opportunities throughout your career or is it relatively uh, stagnant? I, I'm going to answer this one. So uh, learning and gaining experience, I'll be brief. Learning and gaining experience should never stop. So if you have that model in life, You'll, uh, you'll always do right. So learning and gaining experience, always. So if you think you're no longer developing personally and professionally, it's time to change uh, into a new team and something new to do within your, uh, of course, area. So I luckily, uh, luckily I'm in a company uh, like GM that it's very easy to do that without having to change any change to a different company. So you can change teams. But uh, on the other hand, a person like me, I like being very technical and become uh, an expert in the specialist in the area that I'm in. So I've been in the area for the last 15 years, 
but I always do a daily check. Have I learned something today or have I gained professionally? And as long and that what motivates me, what drives me. So and as long as that happens, you're just marching on. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to do our final truths in a life from uh, Ezra Lamja. And uh, we're gonna make this quick. So if you could please share your two truths. Okay, yeah, I I have uh, like, yeah, now three questions. Yeah, one of them is uh, not true. Uh, the first, uh, uh, first uh, statement, uh, I am also called doctor. So I have a doctor title. Uh, that's the first one. The second one is not about me, but about a uh, little bit electrical engineering. So if the, the uh, video game uh, consoles uh, uh, computing system has 54 billion transistor in it, if you know what's transistor, uh, maybe uh, you can uh, somewhat better idea how to handle that statement. And also first cell phone, uh, is used in 1992. So these three statements. So the, I I will uh, tell them again. So first cell phone was uh, used in 1992. The second one is there are 54 billion transistors in a game console uh, computing device, and I'm also called doctor. Thank you, Emma. You're going to have to put the poll up. I don't have access to it. I'm sure the first one was too easy. No one is picking that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good in lying, I guess. Thank you for the statements and it's time to vote if you haven't. I think that we are all good. Uh, Mehmet, if you would like to post the results. All right, okay, uh, would you like to share? And just, a, just a reminder that the order of the questions with the doctor was the first one, and then the first cell phone was the third one. I don't know if that's the, that's just the order that I think that I wrote it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, the first cell phone that we know of was uh, uh, designed and uh, used in 1973. So it was not 92. And uh, yeah, there are 50 bi 54 billion uh, uh, transistors in the latest NVIDIA uh, graphic processing unit, which is used in game consoles. And uh, I'm also called doctor. So when you earn a PhD deg degree, uh, you can use uh, doctor as your uh, title. You are not medical doctor, but uh, it, is, it is a title that you can freely use. Doctor of philosophy, that's even better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I was asked like, what kind of doctor are you? I said, uh, do you have a broken cell phone? Maybe I can fix it. <laughs> Good. I can continue. Thank I don't you. have to. Uh, I don't know if you, yeah, we're going over time, but it's it's okay with me. I don't know. Or uh, do you have a hard stop? We, we don't have a hard stop as far as this. Um, if you guys, it all, um, it all is based on you guys as engineers, whether you guys want to continue, because we have some more questions that we have, or nice questions as well. So if you guys want to continue, we have more questions and they're very, they cover different things. So it's kind of nice. Yep, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can, I can hang on and I can answer as my uh, more questions. Okay. 
Okay, so um, is my question next? Because we kind of got out of order there. Um, I can go with question six that I accidentally skipped. Okay, and then I'll ask question seven and nine. All right. Okay. Um, so the next question is, what are some of your proudest moments in your career and what are some of the lessons you learned along the way from your mistakes? I can go next. Um, so I, I think my proudest moment is when I see a product used by people. Um, I really enjoy people touching the cars and they turn on the lights and using the lift gates and you know the doors and and I really enjoy what I do because I'm just serving the society. Um, that's the I think you get the pleasure of uh, uh, actually uh, seeing people uh, uh, benefiting the technology and I, I'm part of that. I think the, the toughest decisions are or mistakes I made in the past is, uh, and as I said, this very dynamic environment and we make a lot of decisions under pressure. And if we don't actually do uh, our due diligence and cover all the corners, it, it may end up being a, a bigger problem down the road. You may be band-aiding a problem and in, in second time it comes up actually that that's that's a bigger issue because now you're talking about the same issue uh, again with probably the higher cost effects that that's all I have. Okay, I can go next. Uh, the the uh, proudest moment in my career, uh, I definitely second what Chalian said, the products. When you see the products out on the road, that's one. But personal one, more of a personal uh, I received a, a U.S. patent uh, for a, a new idea that my technician and I worked on. So um, that was one of the proudest moments. So uh, that that idea was later built and used by GM. So and my technician no longer is living. So I'll just you know send them like uh, thank you to the club. Um, so the second one is uh, lessons learned. Uh, this is. Um, maybe a very atypical uh, answer you may hear, but um, early in my career, this was a big learning that I never forget, that I must have used, I did this, I did that, uh, yes, uh, you know, whatever, always I, 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 uh, for something that I really did do. Uh, but a, fr a good friend and a colleague uh, once warned me, and some of this came from speaking the language as a second language, uh, as a second uh, speaking English as a second language. Uh, he said that he was a little uh, like taken aback by it. He said, Mine, you always say I, 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 why don't you say we? I was in that team too. So that, that made me realize that, yes, you do not use I, uh, even though it may be really personally you a little bit of help from others, it just does not come across as a, as a, a nice thing to do. It, even nowadays, even if it's just 99.9%, .9 it's me, I always say we. Uh, the, people know who really actually did it. So that would be my biggest lesson learned. So try to not use I so much, especially in a uh, more of a team environment down, in the, down on the road even in your schools or uh, later in the careers. So that's about it. All right, do you guys wanna do the chat questions next? We have two of them right now. I don't think Ed, uh, Ed Uber answered yet. No, I think yeah, it's a similar uh, one. When I like to see, when I see an, uh, something that I developed in the hands of the people uh, or uh, used by uh, people uh, or products, uh, it's the proudest moment. I developed a system that goes into all the cell phones that we use today. Uh, so communication error correction mechanism uh, or technique uh, algorithm. Uh, I developed with Ericsson when I was doing my PhD. So it was then went into standards and then that's uh, right now every uh, cell phone uh, has this uh, has this algorithm in it. Uh, about the mistakes, yeah, we, we all do mistakes and then uh, every day you, you make new 
mistakes and then uh, I think you need to accept and then uh, you need to try to uh, learn from your uh, mistakes. Um, I, my mistakes uh, can be, uh, I mean, mainly I know that technical mistakes like when you are at a program, maybe it doesn't work. Then you say, aha, yeah, that was the problem. And then uh, you try to learn and then do not repeat the same thing again. I think the experienced engineer is the one who made the most mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I may add to that. I just remember the quote, the, my first boss or who actually hired me into GM once told me, he said, Mine, never ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. So like you can make the mistake and then ask for, for uh, you know, if, you're ask, if you ask for permission, you may not be given, but if you do make the mistakes, you may ask for uh, forgiveness. So yeah. go with your ideas. Of course, don't take this to the, you know, the wrong direction, but you know, with the yeah. good intention. Yeah, okay, you can go on to the other questions. Okay, our first question in the chat is, are there any opportunities that you might suggest that these young adults could do in order to see if engineering would be a good career for them? I can start. Uh, there's definitely take your child to work day, um, career day, or you know things like that at GM. Uh, there may be so you may want to hook up with uh, some, um, uh, I guess, uh, parents, friends in the uh, in your uh, community to see. I don't know if GM really allows non, uh, ch you, know, if, uh, you know, someone else's child, but it may. So uh, you can reach out to me, I'll, I'll try to see, because of COVID they did not have it this year, but there's uh, take your child to uh, work, they would be a good opportunity. So I'll leave, you know, I'll then turn it over to you guys, Chalian and Ed. I mean, we have that every day now. I take I my know, child to my that's work. True. <laughs> Very true. Um, I think at FCA, uh, we have a program called co-opt um, i'm not really familiar with the details i just happened to meet one of those uh, high school students um, they come here um, and i'm in the virtual environment for a month or two and they rotate in different areas in the company they may be assigned a simple project or identify a project and make a presentation at the end um, I can find out the details and then send it to this group. I'm not sure what the requirements are and how many they take. And I really don't know any detail, but uh, I just uh, talked to one of those uh, high school students. Yeah, I can add a couple of things to these. Uh, uh, for the uh, the high school kids, students, I think you can, uh, Looking at the university uh, engineering faculty websites, U University of Michigan, uh, Michigan State, and a number of other uh, universities around us, or, or uh, so you may be able to. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but uh, sometimes there are small projects that you can uh, you can work on, and also there are some uh, I think robotics and other. Uh, clubs in your uh, high schools, you can join them and learn uh, a little bit about uh, engineering or engineering related uh, concepts, uh, whether you like these things or not. And also uh, ask a lot of questions to uh, uh, your adults uh, that you come across, your friends, uh, parents, uh, people that are introduced uh, in your family circle, what type of business they do. And you may even ask like, oh, can I come and, uh, talk to you like uh, uh, or can, can I uh, uh, learn more about what you do you have like a, an hour or two that explain uh, you can explain I mean asking questions is the key and also uh, universities are more open compared to the uh, uh, the companies uh, in in sharing uh, the ideas or projects so uh, I especially high school uh, students I Maybe right now it's not the right time, but like when the pandemic is over, uh, then you may like to go visit engineering faculties, engineering uh, uh, schools uh, that you can uh, 
easily go. Yeah, that's, that's all uh, I like to add. Tark, I think there's one more question in the chat. All right, and our second question, question from Aaron was, what is the future of automation and driverless cars in the, your eyes? I can start with that because I'm right in the middle of it. Uh, GM is definitely uh, investing a lot of its resources into it and it's, it's coming. In fact, we've seen the uh, prototypes running around in at the, uh, the, you know, where I work at. So uh, that's the future. And I'm excited for it because when I, you know, when I'm 80 years old, hopefully if I get to that age, I don't want to have to, when you are, you cannot drive anymore, you don't have to worry about getting, you know, to places or relying on others. So you can just hop in your, into your aut autonomous vehicle and uh, drive, you know, have, have it take, take you to places. So, uh, but that is definitely the future for sure. But those vehicles are going to be very expensive. One autonomous vehicle is going to be uh, $300,000 to $500,000. And this is real, but they're going to be shared vehicles. So it's not going to be I'm going to own one, and uh, you know every household is going to own one. There's going to be uh, a lot of them running around. They're going to be very costly, but they'll run around as shared vehicles. So little trade secret. <laughs> it's not secret. I so will it be kind of like Uber, but it just kind of picks you up without anyone driving it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, go ahead, Charlie. No, I was going to ask Aaron, like, he just got his driver's license, so he gave up on driving so quick? Yeah, I'm kind of <laughs> bored with it. I just want to, <laughs> I want to have somebody else drive me now. <laughs> yeah. Quite that, too. Yeah, I think it is, uh, it is critical because for safety and uh, security perspective, autonomous vehicles uh, will be, uh, will drive better than humans uh, in in today's uh, tech. I mean, most of the uh, most of the time they drive better autonomous vehicles and the test track. Uh, they are safer, uh, and that creates like that reduces the collision and fatalities and uh, other uh, issues related to the traffic accidents. So. Uh, as an economical perspective, it makes sense to have autonomous vehicles. Uh, and that's, I think that will be the, uh, that's why it, they will come and uh, they will, uh, uh, and maybe they will come uh, sooner than what we think of, yeah. Okay, so I think if all the engineers have answered that question, we can conclude the webinar and engineers, as you, all learned today are very thorough people. And we saw that here today too, um, through all these questions. But everybody, let's all unmute and give the engineers a round of applause for all the time they sat here today talking to us. So congratulations. Thank you for coming um, today. So. Yeah. Greatly yeah, appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. It's our pleasure. And what a wonderful uh, event you, you all prepared and planned. And I'm so proud to be here. I, I do want to, can I have a couple of closing remarks for just because you all are like my, you know, my own child. So I have to be the, I have to wear my mom hat, right? Mom uh, hat right now. So I did have a slide about what to, how to prepare for a, a, a career in engineering. Uh, of course, you know, besides the science and, you know, all the projects uh, like, or all the, the, the coursework math and physics and all that, there's a couple of things that you should always remember. If one thing that resonates in your mind leaving today should be your soft skills. So the skills that are called interpersonal skills, because those have become everyone in their own little silo can be so good at math, 
so good at uh, uh, physics, but getting your ideas across, changing people's hearts and minds. That's the new, uh, I guess, model. Changing people's hearts and minds becomes uh, through the interpersonal skills. So uh, try to get into teams. Uh, yes, leadership used to be the, the main thing, but now it's the becoming a team member. Try to get into teams, try to work on your uh, personal skills, soft skills, and then uh, everything else will follow. And that'll help you in any career that you choose. So uh, I guess I'll just leave you all with that. And I'm sure you're gonna do also very well in life. So do any of the other two engineers wanna make a short closing remarks as well? Well, my advice is you guys need to improve your communication skills presentation skills. Uh, I think that I'm supporting what Mina said is really the success in any field, not just engineering. You should be able to give a message in an effective way. And as engineers biggest uh, deficiency uh, is the not keeping the things simple. You can see from this meeting, we already exceeded for like 20, 25 minutes, right? We should be able to give message in a, sh in a given time and effectively. I think that's a key success to any, any professional. And you can always reach me from uh, Mehmet if you guys have any questions and I'm glad to answer in, in the future. Yeah, well. yeah I just like to add like engineering profession uh, will, is one of the key uh, professions uh, because it adds value uh, and it, it is, uh, I will say it like uh, farmers and engineers are the ones that generate wealth uh, or uh, put things together and make it work for human, humanity. So uh, that is uh, the key. And if we, as a human uh, and on earth, uh, like if we like to uh, grow and uh, increase efficiency, uh, reliability, etc., we need better engineering uh, and uh, more engineers to solve uh, ever-growing uh, problems. So that's why it is uh, it can be very rewarding uh, for your future. Okay, so this concludes our webinar today. Thank you to all the engineers who came, and thanks to all the participants we had today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Good so luck, much. guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. And goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.